Welcome back. I'm your host, Jerry Chan. This is Frobots 101, part two. And in this episode, we are gonna go over the, personally, one of the more fun things about a Frobot, which is scanning and shooting enemies. So let's dive right into it, shall we? Scanning and shooting enemies on a Frobot is quite simple. There's actually two functions that um, dictate, uh, that, that control this aptly named scan uh, and cannon. Let's go over scan first. So scan takes a degree and a resolution. Okay. And so what that means is if we are to draw our coordinate system again, Remember um, that this is zero degree, this is 90 degrees, this is 180 degrees, and this is 270 degrees. Now, when you scan, you have to provide the degree in which the direction in which you wish to scan relative to your tank and the resolution. Now, the degree can be anything from zero to 360, and the resolution can be uh, anything up to the resolution of your current scanner uh, that's equipped. Now, the Mark 1 scanner has a resolution of plus or minus 10 degrees. Okay, so what happens is when you scan, if your if your point if your tank is at the origin here, if I were to scan, say, if I wanted to scan in this direction then I would need to report, let's say this is, uh, for simplicity's sake, let's say this is 40 degrees off from here. And given the coordinate system of robots, that really means it's 40 degrees short of 360, which means this is actually 320. So I would want to scan 320. And the resolution, what that defines is actually the plus or minus degrees from your scan center. So this, in other words, this delta, this phi right here um, could be up to 10. So it, it gives a sort of a resolution on the scan. So if I were to scan at the maximum resolution, uh, so the, the maximum breadth, lowest resolution, I can put 10, which would effectively mean I'm trying to detect any targets from if I'm aiming at 320 anything which is within radar or hit um, which is in the direction of 310 to 330 would register a hit right so that's what it means to scan in the direction of 320 with a resolution of 10 and in order to do so, let's we can jump right into the code. All we have to do is just tell the robot I want to scan 320, 10, and there you go. That should work. So what we'll do is we'll upload our robot. Okay. So We'll just jump over here to our simulator and we've loaded our Frobot. Uh, we've called it Optimus Prime 2. Um, and what we'll do is we'll click fight and see what happens. Great. So you'll notice that Oct our little buddy Optimus here is sort of um, sending out a, a sort of a, an arc, a, a piece, a slice of a pie. That actually is the indication of the scan. So we're right now scanning at the maximum distance of our scanner. The Mark I scanner has a distance of 700 meters and we're scanning at the widest, um, the widest, res not, not, uh, the widest resolution or the lowest resolution or the widest arc. And so if any robots or any target were to fall within this blink you know, this blinking arc, um, the return of the scan function will be 
the distance to the target, to the hit, the radar ping, the target hit. And and at that point, we can program our program bot to do something about that. Presumably, we'd want to shoot something. So right now, actually, as, as we see here, when the uh, enemy red robot moves into the arc, we would notice something. Now, of course, we didn't do anything to actually see this happen, which is our fault. So what we'll do right now is um, let's let's make this a little bit more um, illustrative. Let's jump back to the code here. Now, what we can do is that if the scan is something other than zero, in fact, we can just say not equal zero. All right, through the miracle of time-lapse photography, um, what I've added is first we're going to um, call the scan function, the scan uh, um, the uh, action. We'll scan at the uh, at three three twenty with a resolution of ten as described. We'll store that result into hit. Now hit could be nothing because we could actually have hit nothing, uh, or it could be a distance to the target that was uh, that was detected. So we first check whether hit is equal, uh, not equal to zero, and that's how you do the not equal in Lua. If it is not equal to zero, that means we hit something, and if we hit something, that means. Um, we want to store the fact that we hit something into the debug so that we can see um, the results of that, just to know that the scanner is working. So let's see how that goes. Let's skedaddle over to our... Okay, that looks more likely that he, we're going to get hit. So we're going to sit and wait. Or we can just snap our fingers with time-lapse photography and... There we go. We get hits. Look at that. You notice that once the enemy robot walked into our scan range, we are now getting a radar return, which is the value of the distance of the hit. And once it walked out of the range, we no longer updated the uh, the debug message. So, but our scans are now returning zero. So that's actually how a scanner works. So it's quite simple, actually. Uh, now, the one thing that is worth mentioning that I'm going to have to go back to the whiteboard for right now is that uh, what is this notion of resolution? Now you saw that it's um it had a wedge, you know, shaped pi. Now if I were to if I set it to something to something less than 10 degrees, it would have been a thinner wedge. Um of course that's less detection area. So one might wonder why would you want to detect less? Right? Well, here's the reason why. The way the scanner works is now if this is our tank, this is our robot in our tank, and if we sent out a scan in this direction, right? Um, once again, the maximum scan distance or the scan distance of the Mark One scanner is always seven hundred meters, so anything within anything within that uh, distance will be detected. Now, why would I choose to voluntarily scan at a narrower? I didn't draw that to scale; it's a little bit wonky, but a narrower resolution versus a wider one where I would scan something that would look like this, right? Because obviously I would be able to detect something if the, uh, if the enemy robot was here at point A or here at point B, whereas if I use the narrower option, I would only be able to detect the robot whether it was within this inner um, range and so only like point c would be detected now why would i want to do that the reason is that the scanner as you've probably noticed only returns one one number back it doesn't really return it returns that number like the distance to the hit now the key thing is that while you get a distance to the hit that doesn't necessarily tell you what angle the target is at in terms in terms of your 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 range here. So for instance, if I got a return value and it was 360, let's just say it's somewhere around here, 360, right? Do I I do not know whether or not the 360 is at this point or it's this point because there are two places where you could infer the distance of 360 meters from your robot and it would be it would be anywhere within the um the boundaries of um your your scan 
range. In fact, there's not only two points, there's a range of points it could be, depending on, um, it, it would be effectively an arc, right? So, so when you get a return value 360, there is an arc line, a piece of a circle, in other words, where your enemy could be, and that's where your scanner detected it. Now, if you choose a wider resolution, then the, the chance, the, the arc is bigger, and therefore, the chance of it being anywhere along this larger line is bigger and larger. And therefore, you don't really know exactly where your enemy is if you get a hit with a wide resolution, with a wide scan uh, uh, range. Because even though you know that the distance is there, how do you know where to shoot, right? You, you, you know you scanned here in the middle, but you don't exactly know where your enemy is vis-a-vis -vis that point. So I know I scanned here in the middle, but if the enemy is like here, or here, or here, or here, we don't know. So sometimes it may make more sense to make a lot of dip, a sequence of precise scans that are more narrow in width, and you just do a sequence of scans, in which case one of the return values will be more accurately uh, give you information about where your enemy is. For instance, if you scanned with this narrow narrower range and you get a hit, then you know your enemy is in this arc somewhere. And therefore, you're probably okay just firing anywhere within that arc and the blast radius of the explosion of, of, of your cannon is going to damage your opponent somehow. But if you scan with a really wide range and you shoot somewhere in the middle or you shoot somewhere randomly on that arc, you know, it's a good chance you might just miss them. So that's the reason why it matters. Um, how you choose the resolution of your scan. Do you want a wide hit? You just want to see if something's there, somewhere there, and you don't really know where it is, or do you want to know more specifically exactly where that hit is, the, the, the radar hit is, and so you can actually do something about it with a more in a more precise manner. So that's scanning. All right, so let's talk about the next thing, cannon. Um, the cannon, which is just firing, uh, acts very much like scan. Um, you have to pass it a degree and a range in this case, which is basically w in which direction you want to fire and how far do you want to shoot. I mean, we don't really model ballistics in a way, in, 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 in any sort of like realistic way because the game is a two-dimensional simulator. So we don't really need to worry about how far up in the air it goes, et cetera, et cetera. We just need to know that it's going to travel from the point of firing to the range and it will detonate at that range. So will bullets fly through opponents if uh, in the middle en route? Yes, so they will. They, um, basically, if there is an opponent, let me draw this out. If there is an opponent in the middle So if I were to fire, let's do with cannon now. If I were to fire from here, and this is the range, so um, I'm going to fire to say 500 meters. If there is an opponent in the middle, they they will be passed by the bolt, by the cannon shell. So the shell will fly over the target and explode in this target and then do blast radius damage at the point of explosion. So you can kind of think of them as, uh, you can kind of think of them as flying over because it's not it's not a laser beam, in other words. At least the Mark I cannon is a cannon. Now, future um, add-ons, robots may employ laser beams, in which case um, intersects with enemies on the path of travel to the destination of the, uh, the range might actually do damage. But that's... Um, you know, that's for future. So let's do that. Uh, let's jump over to the code and let's get our robots firing. All right. So I've modified the code to do a couple of things. And let's walk through it one uh, step at a time. First thing I want to do is uh, we're going to incorporate this robot that's just doing the, the simple scanning right now to actually just scan in um, every quadrant, you know, four, four directions in, uh, in a circle around itself. And if it finds anything, it will shoot. Okay, so this is like the basics of any sort of like offensive strategy that you want to program in your robot. Okay, 
So in order to do that, uh, first I needed some sort of like a counter and we covered counters in the previous uh, videos. So we, we're going to set a counter, which is just going to count through the quadrants we want to scan. So since quadrants, there's four of them. So let's set the initial, um, the initial value to four. Now I want to set my status right now. So let's get back into the, the, the habit of um, writing a finite state machine. And so the state that we're in, this robot is just going to basically have one state. It's just going to continuously be in the scan and fire state. It doesn't really do anything besides that. There's no, there's no reaction or anything besides this. I'm just going to spin on my, on my, on my axis and uh, scan and fire. So I will always be in the scan and fire state. But it's good just to state that explicitly. Now, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to take the total angles in a circle and then divide it by the counter. So we're going to get a number um, that is, um, you know, a multiple of uh, six, uh, 90, I apologize, 90. And so that will be our aim. And then what we're going to do is we're going to scan at that aim, that direction, the aiming direction, I, I guess I could have called it, um, at the widest um the widest resolution. And then I will always decrement the, the count uh, variable by one so that we're continually, so the next time we are, uh, we execute, we'll, we'll scan a different quadrant. Now, now our if statement, our conditionals is if it's hit, then, um, well, we will still print that we found something and now we're gonna shoot. So this is where we will call the cannon function so where in which direction do we want to shoot? Well, clearly we only have one direction unless we want to be, you know, unless we want to be uh, um, throw luck to the uh, in, into the equation and just pick a random direction. We want to actually shoot in the direction where we got a hit from our scanner. And remember, because given the fact uh, the way the scanners work and that there's a resolution of the scanner, that may not exactly be where our target is sitting, but it's the best guess that we got. And so, how far? What what is the range? To our cannon. Well, clearly that is simply the return value of the hit. So the hit is actually the range at which we want to fire our cannon. We want it to go at least that distance. So remember, we discussed that the scanner is effectively telling that your enemy is on the arc of the circle at that range. You don't know where in the arc, but you know, you're going to throw it out to that range and, you know, hope uh, you get lucky. And then the final thing we need to do um, otherwise, we'll have an interesting bug in our robot is that when the quadrant is zero, then we just need to reset it back to four so that we can continually loop. So let's see how that looks. All right. So let's see how that goes. Optimus Prime, fight. And okay, we clearly have a bug here. Optimus seems like he's always scanning in the 90 direction. What? is going wrong well we do see that he is in the scan and fire state so that's clearly working but he doesn't seem to be ever changing the direction he's scanning in. so something is obviously wrong and let's let's figure out what it might be let's take a look back at our code okay and taking a look at our code i think um i i've this illustrates a problem right here. Uh, this actually illustrates a problem that if we don't remember to initialize our finite state machine, we'll always have these kind of issues, um, which is a habit that we have to get ourselves into doing um, every time we build a robot. What I mean is that we never had a state where we set the variables up initially, and we should always do that. So basically what we should always do is if state.status equals nil so basically it's the initial state then do these setup things such as set the state variable of the quadrant because otherwise we end up setting quadrant four every time we execute and clearly then it's never going to really count down because we always just reset it back to four so that was a silly mistake but it's a learning experience and so now uh, we can give ourselves uh, another try okay so let's see how this uh this fares now. Okay, great. We can see Optimus is um, rotating through some scan quadrants. So he is doing that properly. Um, he's placed kind of at randomly at the top right hand corner of this of the uh, arena. So it's really, um, you can't really see the other scans in the other directions. 
And we also, I've noticed that there is a, a, another bug. I mean, he's not exactly scanning in the four quadrants that uh, we expected. Probably something to do with our math, you know, those off by one uh, mathematical errors. Um, but he is doing he is doing what um, we intend. Now let's let's just see if the random enemy robot sort of falls into his scan range and uh, gets shot. In fact, we could have just increased the chances of this happening by adding more enemies. We probably should. Let's just do that. Let's make it so that he has to fight five randoms. Certainly, one of them is going to fall into his scan range. There we go. And looks like he might scan one now, and we'll see if he shoots right about now. Oh my god, just so lucky. Oh, there now, he'll detect this one. There he goes. Do you see that? See, he fired. He fired exactly, he got two shots off. Um, whereas that that robot sort of went through his scan range. So Success! We got him scanning. We got him um, basically detecting where enemies are and reacting to, to that. So computational costs is a game balancing mechanism by which all the commands that your robot can execute have an intrinsic cost associated with them in order to limit the number of those commands that can be executed in one robot cycle. So the cannon cost 25 computational units. Um, driving command costs 40, and scan costs two. And all the other ones such as lock X, Y, damage, etc., speed, these just cost one. Okay, And every CPU cycle, depending on your robot, but the Mark I tank has um, or the Mark I um, uh, CPU rig has 60 cycles to, to spread around. So what this means is effectively you can end up shooting twice, right? You can have two cannons. Cannons times two will equal 50. You can call one drive or any number of scans that of the remaining amount of computational cycles you have to spend. Now, if you actually spend more than your limit of computational cycles in one in one um, iteration, one cycle of your robot, you go into a penalty CPU overload mode where your CPU, your robot will be will be paused or put on uh, um, in in stasis for about one second. So it turns out that if you want to run efficiently, you should. You should spend your CPU cycles and the commands that you execute in one cycle um, smartly so you don't end up overloading your CPU. This is to prevent robots from, for instance, trying to fire uh, you know, cannons continuously, uh, which, uh, which obviously it has some limiting factors as well because the cannon is, may not have enough magazines to fire more than that amount of times. But for instance, executing too many drive commands in one cycle is a way to say computationally starve out the simulator while not really doing anything that effective. So this is the way that um, that all your robot rigs, your robot algorithms are limited in what they can execute. In our next sessions, we'll cover putting these two concepts together, putting together the the notion of movement and and, and going somewhere in the in the arena, perhaps reacting to when you are hit. Um, with the, with some offensive strategies, which is scanning for your opponents and shooting at them. So thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time.